there is a question about recitation and menstruation. So I want to break down for you very quickly what the scholars have said if you are in menses and you want to recite. There are, like most issues of fiqh, scholars who differ on the evidences. There are some scholars, and it's the widespread opinion. The widespread opinion means the majority of the madahid follow that it is not permissible for a woman to recite a menstruation. This is the Hanafis, the Shafi'is, the Hanbalis. Now, this is a general position of the madhab, which means scholars within the madhab may hold a different position. Like some scholars may hold a different position than the general madhab. However, they say what you can do are verses that are du'a. So for example, when you're sitting in the car, what do you say when you sit in the car? So that's a du'a, but it's also a verse in the Qur'an. So because it's a verse in the Qur'an, if your intention is I'm going to recite the Qur'an, the scholars of these madhahib say that's not permissible. But if your intention is you're going to make the car du'a, the scholars of this position say it is permissible. Does that make sense? Then there's the other scholars of the other position. So the other position, there are a number of scholars, but the general, I'll just give you some names that maybe you've heard of. Uh, Bukhari, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim, Al-Bani, Ibn Hazan, um, Al-Tabari, and there are more. Those are probably some of the ones you're most familiar with. What are their evidences? So those who say that it's not permissible, there's no verse in the Qur'an that denotes anything related to this issue, so there's no verse. They, they, they base it on hadith. So the first and main evidence, which is the sound narration, is that Aisha Aliyah mentioned the Prophet Sallallahu would recite the Qur'an in her lap and lay down in her lap when she was in Mensis. So scholars like Ibn Taqib al Aid, for example, the way that he explains this is, Unless it was not normal for her to typically recite Qur'an, and she's explaining the situation as a exception to the rule, it doesn't make sense for her to have mentioned it in the first place. Does that make sense? So they are basing their understanding of it not being per permissible on an inference that Aisha radiallahu anha would have not made that statement in the first place had it not been a big deal. Does that make sense? Number two, by the way, this is the speediest of class on this issue because you can easily actually be tough. So please feel free to study it in much more detail. I'm just giving you a summary. The second proof is that there are a number of different narrations that talk about a person who is in Janaba and a woman who is in Mensis not reciting the Quran. These are, these are hadith and they are statements of righteous people or very companions. However, there is discrepancy on the authenticity of basically all of them. Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Hazm, both of them say there is no authentic narration that actually addresses the, it in this way. But scholars who form the majority say there are so many like weaker narrations that together they, they form the ruling. Does that make sense? Okay, the third thing is Qiyas. Qiyas means that scholars look at one circumstance and then they say, okay, if in this circumstance, this is the rule, then in a similar circumstance, this is the same rule. Does that make sense? So they say that if a person is in the state of Janaba, which the only reason I'm not explaining is because of the age group here, so I see a lot of younger people. So please look it up if you are not sure what I mean. But Janaba has rulings of no recitation according to the majority. So they say, if a person is in Janaba and you can't recite, it's major ritual impurity, which means you need to do what? which is the shower. So they say if major ritual impurity is recitation, uh, is janaba when you can't recite, then a woman in Mensis is in a state of major ritual recitation and therefore she cannot recite. However, Imam al-Qarafi says that's not a fair comparison because you can just, one, you chose to get into that circumstance, and two, you can take a shower and get out. But for a woman, it's completely out of her control. It can last up to 15 days if you do not follow the Hanafi Madhab. And what do you do for 15? Every single month for half of the month, you're not going to recite the Qur'an. What if you're a Qur'an student? What if you're trying to teach your children? What if you're a Qur'an teacher? There's all these circumstances where that makes the Qur'an so difficult to access. And so, the scholars who are in the position, and these are the main, the main evidences for the position that says it's not permissible. The scholars who say it is permissible, they base it on one, that the Prophet wasallam would always recite the Qur'an, would encourage recitation of the Qur'an, and then the Qur'an said, So recite what is easy for you. So that means it's a command to recite in general, and you would not go against a command unless you have explicit evidence 
otherwise. And because they say the evidence of the majority is not explicit enough, according to this opinion, the default is you recite at all times. Does that make sense? The second proof that they use is that Aisha only went for Hajj. And when she went for Hajj, what happened? She got her period. Yeah, she got her period. And she was crying. And the Prophet went to her. And he was comforting her. And he never told her. The only thing he mentioned is not to do tawaf. But he said to do everything else. So the scholars of this position say, he didn't say don't recite the Qur'an. And Hajj, you're going to recite the Qur'an. You're in Hajj. Of course you're going to recite the Qur'an. So had it not been permissible, the Prophet would have said that it's prohibited. Now side note, because a lot of women take this narration and think when you're in Hajj, you don't make a tawaf. So very quickly, I'm going to in one second tell you the ruling of what to do if you're in Hajj. But he, his ruling in the circumstance, because in his time, there was a caravan who would go for Hajj altogether. You know, you're going from Syria, you're going from Lebanon, you're going from Yemen, you're going from all these places, you go with a Hajj caravan. It would take months to get there, and then you're there, and you have a caravan, you go back. In his time period, there were, the ruler would give money to ensure there were Hajj stations to meet the Hajj. So let's say there's a caravan here, they leave from Mecca, and then they get to here, and there's a group here. They refill their water, they get food, they keep going, okay? Then they go here, another Hajj caravan. The state is paying for these caravans. In Ibn Taymiyyah's time, the state changed and withdrew that money. So these caravans went away. What happened? Now they have to go from Mecca for months and months on end to wherever they need to go. Bandits realize there's not going to be groups of people all over the place to protect them. Which means what? They can raid the caravans. So they started coming and they were killing people and stealing all of their property. So women who used to stay in Mecca for a long time so that they can finish their period and then finish everything they need to do, no longer were able to do that without threatening their life or their property. And so Ibn Taymiyyah said, none of the scholars before me had this circumstance because people used to just stay until everyone was done and then they would go. So Ibn Taymiyyah's position is, that if a woman goes for Hajj and she knows she's not going to finish while she is there, let's say you are going to last for seven days, you're only in Mecca for three days, you know you're not going to finish. So what do you do? You actually go ahead and you make Hajj, or you make Umrah. Let me just say Umrah because Hajj is a little bit different with ruling. Let me just say Umrah because most of us have this circumstance in Umrah. So if you know you're going to go for Umrah, so what do you do? You make Umrah exactly the same. But you don't pray the two Lakas after the Qawaf. I got a message from a sister in Mecca like two weeks ago, and subhanAllah, I've been so overwhelmed, I don't check my Instagram messages like almost never now. I just happened to open Instagram and see this message. She said, I'm in Mecca, I was in Ihram, I got my period, I know I'm no longer about, allowed to make Umrah, so I got out of Ihram, and I'm wondering, can I just make dua close to the, to the masjid? This made me so angry. You're not out of Ihram, you're in Ihram. Who taught her and all of us how that we don't know what to do? So the point is, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says to just make Umrah as if you would just make Umrah, just don't do the two rakahs of the Salah of the Tawaf. However, this is Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion. He also says there's no sacrifice to give. The Hanafis have the same opinion, but the Hanafis say you need to give a sacrifice because making, excuse me, making Tawaf is not uh, permissible when you're on your period and therefore you give a sacrifice to make up for having made tawaf. Now if you're gonna be in Mecca and you're gonna finish, just wait and finish, and then make umrah. These are for circumstances which you wouldn't. The reason I wanted to tell you that is because when I explained this hadith, I actually had someone say that they're going from Mecca to Mecca and they had attended a lecture where I mentioned it and they know they don't need to make tawaf when they're in, in their menses and I don't want that confusion here. So please, if you're going inshallah, seek clarification advice from a shaykha or a shaykh before you go, inshallah. But just so there's no, so there's no one in Mecca who messages me and says, I heard from your lecture, not supposed to make tawaf. So that's Ibn Taymiyyah's position. Now back to the recitation issue. Back to the recitation issue. This position is that the Prophet didn't tell Aisha radiallahu anha not to make, not to recite Quran. Therefore, it's permissible to recite Quran. Does that difference make sense? Yes? Okay. That is for recitation. That's different from touching the mushaf. Touching the mushaf, the difference of opinion on that issue is derived from an ayah of the Qur'an and the same hadith of Aisha and Hajj. But that's not a topic we're covering right now. I just wanted to 
let you know how scholars look at one piece of evidence, and then they have so many different understandings. So when we look at women's voices in Quran, we see women who don't recite while they're on their period. For centuries, we've had women who don't recite because they follow the majority of the, the Nadaqib's opinion. And inshallah, they are rewarded for every second they don't recite. And even if the angels are not commanded to look for women who don't recite, typically they would be reciting if they could. So if no Qayyim mentions, then the Prophet them talks about a person who is sick or traveling, and when they are sick or they are traveling, the rewards of what they used to do continue. And so inshallah, you still get the reward. If you typically recite and then you stop for 10 to 15 days, inshallah, you're still being rewarded. Because the only reason you're doing it is out of your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you follow this opinion or that opinion, you're doing it for the sake of Allah. You are doing it to get closer to the Qur'an. Sometimes keeping us uh, ourselves away from worship is a test because we want to be there, we want to be doing it. And sometimes in that test is a form of tazkiya, a form of purification that brings us closer to Allah in a different way. So for those who follow that opinion, may Allah raise your race. And for those who don't and who use 